Hello, my friends. Welcome to Word Made Digital. I'm your host, Joanne LaFleur. On today's episode, we have my friend Katie Strandlin. Katie is a champion of dreamers. She's an encourager of creatives. She's a friend to artists. She believes that in partnership, together, we can do work that changes the world and that every dream deserves a strategy. So she's worked with all kinds of people as really the administrator and the event organizer. Maybe you could say the left brain to the right brain of creative and communicator type people. Currently, she's the executive director of Christine Kane Ministries, which means that she works alongside Nick and Christine Kane, bringing life and organization to the creative visionaries of things like A21 Campaign, Propel Women, and then Christine Kane's own communications work in things like speaking and books. You've probably heard of Christine Kane, but you may not know some of the people on her team who are behind all this amazing work that they do together all over the world. So it's gonna be a great conversation, an important one for us who work with people who are more administrative for us to understand how to work well together with those kinds of people and Katie's one of them so thanks again to our sponsor of season two Wycliffe College it's an evangelical graduate school at the University of Toronto I went there myself and for me the theological education was a complement to my business degree and it was really very foundational in my career and what I do it gave me some vocabulary for my faith that I could use to help teach other people as I communicate or do creative work or do preaching and speaking and it gave me a way really to approach church life and scripture from the context of the whole picture of God's story in the Bible and in church history not just like a small view I was able to spend time looking at the whole thing so hey I encourage you to take a class and try it out I actually think you're gonna love Wycliffe it's surprisingly affordable for a theological education and they hold really high academic standards, partly because they're associated with, affiliated with University of Toronto, which means that you get a degree from Wycliffe College and University of Toronto, which is continuously rated one of the top universities in the entire world. So it's an amazing education, uh, both on paper, but also in your mind and in your soul. I, I hope that you would consider it if you're considering theology. You can check out uh, wycliffecollege.ca slash wordmadedigital. There's a conversation there with me about what it, it was in my life, what the impact was in my life. And uh, yeah, just check out the website if you're thinking about studying anything to do with Bible and theology. All right, no more uh, ado. We want to get into the conversation with Katie Stranlin. Here we go. Welcome to the Word Made Digital Podcast with Joanna LaFleur. You're listening to Season 2, sponsored by Wycliffe College. Word Made Digital brings you interviews with brilliant Christian creatives and communicators to inspire, challenge, and equip you in your own work. The church carries the best news in the world, so we want to help you be the best creatives and communicators in the world. Here we go. Hi, Katie. Thanks so much for being on podcast today. Thanks for having me. I'm pumped to be here. And we have been friends for a little while at a distance. And um, uh, we met through Jenny Katrin in Nashville many years ago when you were in kind of a different role. And uh, I'd love us to kind of get there in the conversation about where you've come from, where you're going. But tell us a little bit, like, who are you today? <laughs> What's your bio? Uh, who am I today? So I currently um, live in Southern California, um, and I work Christine Kane in her ministries and Propel Women, um, as well as A21, um, the um, Happy Braid, as we call it, kind of all three entities together, um, executive director role. So I oversee all things related to um, Chris's personal ministry, so books and you know, online and resources and kind of oversee all that from a strategy standpoint, kind of operational, um, as well as her calendar speaking, um, just kind of keeping all the pieces together. Yeah. So the reason I wanted to have this conversation with you is because you're the administrative uh, 
life behind some like visionary leaders, not just Christine Kane in the past. I want to talk about that, this business that you ran um, for many years on your own and how that kind of developed for you. Because I love that a lot of people listening to this podcast are the communicator or the creative person that probably is less administratively inclined. And so I hope that this is a conversation that we can help them get an insight into how your brain works, like as the person who's coming alongside their vision, um, so that they can um, treat the person in your role with great honor and respect and love and and ultimately make increased team dynamics through getting into your head a little bit about how how the administrator yep. thinks. <laughs> yeah. So. so yep. Many years ago, when we first met in Nashville, you were you were doing this in a different kind of. You were working for lots of different leaders and lots of different organizations. Yep. Tell us about the story of Dirty Work. That's the business, and like how you got into that in the first place. Yeah, um, honestly, it was one big accident. Um, but <laughs> I'm a small town girl from farm country, Minnesota. Went to school in Wisconsin. I was going to be a teacher. I was going to teach in the inner city. I was going to save the world. It was going to huh. be amazing. And, um, long story short, God said, yeah, no, um, not so much. And so I ended up, um, helping to plant a church, did that for two years where I, um, basically I didn't preach and I did not sing everything else, <laughs> pretty much my responsibility. So okay. everything from accounting to website to social media, which was just starting out at the time to videos and media for worship and what that, uh, the beauty of that season was I learned to do, I learned a lot about a ton of different things. And so I was not a specialist in terms of a technician of video editing, could dabble in all of it. Um, and so two years into that was, um, it was just really clear to me that God was moving me on for a variety of reasons. Um, and so um, really on a whim, I had been there for a conference, um, and I'd gone back to Wisconsin and felt the weirdest homesick feeling that I really had never felt in my life. And so when it came time um, to leave the church and move into a new season, I thought, why not Nashville? Hmm. So I sold everything I owned, packed up my car, and drove down there. Found a roommate on Craigslist. It was quite the adventure. Oh, my goodness. Um, a roommate on Craigslist. <laughs> that sounds like the start yes. of some Netflix horror film <laughs> documentary or something. <laughs> yes, I did not die. I was not threatened. Um, it was great. And it like it got me there, you know? Um, and yeah. shortly after I moved, um, I had an acquaintance um, at the time ask me if I would help him um, with a few projects. And what he said to me was... Um, he said, I, said, I am such a creative. And he said, I think you understand my creative brain and you're really good at getting things done. Um, so will huh. you help me complete these projects that I've been trying to complete for like two years? And so I said, sure. Um, and so I was, you know, just like contracting with him, helping him with some of that. And then I had the year prior did a conference called the Story Conference. Hmm. Um, which actually still exists these days. It's held in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it started in Chicago um, by the name of a guy named Ben Arment um, at the time. Um, I had gone to the conference. It, I think, just was really impactful in my life at that time. And so I'd offered to volunteer. And um, that started with a tiny, small piece. And the responsibility kind of grew as different things. Um, and so... With that and with this friend that I was working with, um, kind of all of a sudden emailing me and calling me and saying, hey, like, so-and-so says you do this, whatever this was, um, can I hire you? And most of the time, I would go Google this, <laughs> whatever it was, and go, can I figure out how to do that? Yep. Um, and I'd say, sure. Um, and then... <laughs> I love it. Literally... literally, literally Oftentimes that was what happened. And so little by little, I like just had all these clients, um, but I didn't yet, I would say I didn't think of it as like a potential business at the time. And then one day, um, Ben actually, who is an incredible of ideas and champion of dreamers, 
and just champion of people looked at me and said, you know, what are you doing with your life? And I said, well, like I was actually doing a lot of tutoring at the time because I had finished my degree and had my, you know, education degree. And so I was doing a lot of tutoring. Like it was financially supporting me. And um, he said, you need to start a company and you need to call it dirty work because that's what you do for people. They argue with him. And um, it became very clear that like, I felt like God was asking me in the moment, like, what reason do you have not to give it a try? Um, huh. And I didn't have one. Um, and so I said, okay. So I kind of started formalizing it into um, an actual thing. And a couple months later, you know, officially launched with website and all that. Um, and continued doing that for six and a half years. Yeah. Uh, so and when you're kinda, saying the, when you're saying the it, like what is the it? Yeah. Like what did you do yeah. with Dirty Work? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we did event management um, and administrative support. Uh, now that administrative support looks like everything from, um, you know, like, travel, like personal assistant in terms of looking travel and emails and those sorts of things to really helping people set up kind of the operational side of their business. Um, we ended up working with a lot of authors who were speakers, um, small nonprofits, um, entrepreneurs. Um, and on the conference side, it was like a lot of the operational logistics behind a conference. So everything related to venue and registration and, um, you know, organizing a volunteer team and um, all of those, really the administrative pieces behind the experience of a conference. Yeah, yeah. And basically continuing to see that a lot of people aren't good at that. <laughs> like, I would imagine, like, did this come naturally to you? And it's kind of like, oh, like, uh, how, how do you not know how to do this? It just sort of is intuitive. <laughs> it does. It's very much like my brain, um, my brain thinks in puzzles. My brain thinks in huh. like, I, I have a problem solving thing in my brain that like, just never shuts off. So I'm constantly like looking at things and going, oh, you could do it this way. And it could be more effective or more efficient, or you could you accomplish your result this way. Um, it's like, anytime I see a hurdle, my brain instantly starts thinking about a way around it or through it or, you know. Hmm. Um, so, yes, yeah, very much comes naturally to me. Um, and I and yet I did discover, it didn't take me long to discover that it's not common. Um, and I think that um, especially not common to, because most people who have that um, skill set have like the creative side of things to them is like a foreign language. Um, yeah. And so to... to really understand the creative brain and the creative process and also understand the system side and the process side um, and logistics um, is definitely not, it's not something that just like you find often, mm -hmm. I would say. Um, and that was always a challenge. Like as I built a team with my business is like finding other people who um, could also live in that intersection of um, yeah, it could be vision. translation between these two worlds. <laughs> yeah, well, I think maybe maybe it's a stereotype for me, but but maybe it's not fair. So administrators listening, I'm sorry if this is this is just a stereotype, <laughs> but it's kind of like accountants, like this sort of like mm -hmm. like lower on the social skills, emotional IQ, you know, and really yeah. good at spreadsheets and data and details, but but then not fun, to, not enjoyable to work with as a, you know, high yeah. capacity leader because um, they don't maybe know how to translate the detail into a friendly working relationship. <laughs> and, but yeah. obviously, obviously that's the, that's sort of the key behind what you've been able to do is that you can translate between yeah. these two worlds. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's really cool. And, I mean, yeah, and obviously there's a huge need for it in, and were all your clients, were they, were these Christian clients or were they the church clients or was it uh, like other kinds of businesses? Yep. Um, I would say every person that I worked with was a Christian. That didn't necessarily mean that the work that they did was exclusive to, yeah. you know, like professional ministry world. 
Um, some of them were, you know, definitely entrepreneurs or, you know, solopreneurs as we called them in the marketplace. Um, but they were all definitely believers at their, at their core. Yeah. Yeah. And so, me, uh, along the way, uh, of mm-hmm. building this business, um, you kind of, again, unexpectedly fell into the job that you do now. Like, it seems like the mm-hmm. job you do, I would imagine maybe is not something, uh, you know, if people are thinking, oh, it would be amazing to work for a leader like Christine Kane. It's not usually the kinds of jobs that there's like an application on the website for. <laughs> so right. how, how yeah. did you, how did you even come into contact with the organization? Yeah. Um, as is the case with everyone that I worked with, um, it was through relationship. Um, mm. So it was through, um, I was working with a church um, in North Carolina and um, I was out there. They brought Christine in to speak for an event and I was out there and um, got chatting with Nick, um, Christine's husband. And six months later, he called and asked um, if he could hire me. And <laughs> so I actually started, I started working with the team um, on a remote basis, um, mm. just kind of handling everything related to Christine's speaking engagements and their travel and calendar, um, which in and of itself is a lot since they travel about 280 days a year, if not more. Um, and then about two years into it, um, through a series of events, um, the conversation came up about moving into this expanded role. Um, as we made some, we were shifting people around in terms of roles. And so I, said, okay. And I shut down my business and moved huh. to California. And so I've been in this full-time kind of like director role for a little over two years now um, here in California. So definitely, uh, you know, something that unfolds, I think, organically. Yeah. People, you know, have like young girls, especially will ask, you know, like, I want to do what you do. How do I do that? And oftentimes I say, well, you kind of have to, you know, like I do think it's, I think it's one of those roles where, um, looks a lot more glamorous than it is. Um, and it's incredibly rewarding and it's a lot of work and it's what you would expect. And so, um, it's definitely one of those roles. Just have to have a deep passion to serve and to help. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I would imagine, and it's such a high trust role. Like it's not the kind of thing that, again, along the lines of you don't just kind of apply to a role like this. When you're, if people aspire to, they have your kind of skill set and they have a dream of working with senior leadership in any organization in there, maybe it's in their local church or it's in a business in their community, you have um, a level of access and influence and information that means you have to have com- like the complete trust of your leader, right? And yeah. that doesn't just yeah. happen, uh, you know, you know, on a on a resume that you send in. <laughs> it's through yeah, relationship. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Now, I'm, I'm curious about just shifting gears for a second. Like you've obviously in your career, you've done a bunch of moves. Um, and I imagine in your job now, you travel a ton. How does that go for you in your personal life, your family life, your personal relationships? Like, how do you find all these major moves and kind of starts over in new communities? How do you do that? <laughs> how do you find new friends? Yeah. Um, you know, on a practical level, I honestly don't know. Um, so when I moved to Nashville, it I really was dropped into community um, for me was really about community. Like I felt like God took me there um, in large part for the relationships that I would develop there. And because of that, he took care of that and he made that happen. Um, And the travel was difficult. I actually travel less now than I did in that season. Um, Hmm. My first two years in Nashville, I was not home for more than four or five weeks at a time. Um, so I was like leaving town every four or five weeks, which definitely made it, um, more challenging to kind of lay down roots there. Um, but, um, the move, you know, the season in California here has been different. Um, it's not as much about community for me. Um, it's definitely been, I think a lot more about the work that I'm doing. Um, that said, I've developed a handful of you know, of friends here, um, as well as maintain a lot of community remotely in Nashville. And um, I have some dear friends from that season who 
are stuck with me for life. Um, but my <laughs> that's good. Yeah, my community definitely looks different in this season um, than it did, you know, in the season prior to prior to this. Um, and I think God gives you grace for that. Like I really do. I think that He graces us for the season He has us in, mm-hmm. um, and you know, He's able to. Um, he keeps the maybe the longing for a ton of community at bay, I think, you know, um, and gives us the, the, the ability to kind of be content, um, with where we're at. Yeah. 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 Well, and I know for some people, uh, as you said, like the, the dream of traveling is, is a dream for them. But then when you actually get into it, it's actually like much less glamorous and much more tiring. And there's a loneliness too. Um, when you're away mm-hmm. from your community and things like that. So, yeah, but that, like, God, as you've said, like, that God is giving you what you need as you need it. Yeah. And, I mean, if you're going to come home, California is not a bad place to land. <laughs> and absolutely, absolutely. I do I do believe that, you know, living a couple miles from the ocean definitely um, helps uh, in navigating this season of, you know, carrying a lot um, at work and all of that. Like, it, it works wonders. Twenty minutes by the beach. Yeah, you feel like a new person. <laughs> yeah, that'll help you with that'll help you de-stress after yes. a, a day yes. of details and deadlines. Yeah. Yeah. So, absolutely. so what do you think uh, makes a great assistant? I mean, I'm not trying to make maybe get you to like toot your own horn exactly. It's maybe weird to yeah. talk about it, but like what in and you've seen other people do the kind of work you do. What are what are some of the skills or the things that a leader needs in their assistant? That is a good question. Um, I think really, at the end of the day, a really great assistant, it's much more of an art, I think, than most people would imagine. And I think that's true of a lot of things. Um, being a really great anything is an art, and it's there's a lot of nuances in it. It is much about you know character and personality as it is about skill set. Um, and... But I think a really great assistant is someone who has the ability to not just check things off of the to-do list, um, but can also figure out what needs to be on the to-do list. So it's someone who has the ability to kind of grasp the bigger picture of things um, and who can have vision for the vision, um, as I like to say. So someone who can go, I see, I can see that my leader's idea coming to life and I can figure out how we're going to get there. Um, and who attention to detail is obviously extremely important. Um, and I would say that is probably one of the, um, I think that's something a lot of people would talk about and would say, um, but the actuality of that is not a skill it's not like a widespread skill, I would say. Um, like we, so we have an administrative coordinator also who works with me and she actually, um, started out as, um, one of our volunteers, um, as one Mm -hmm. of our, we have like volunteer interns that, and so she was placed with me and, um, the reason, the number one reason that I was like, we need, to hire her. And the reason that she's a good fit is because she was more detail oriented than I was. Um, (laughs) She was, she was catching details that I wasn't catching, which is amazing. Um, And so cannot stress the detail part enough. Um, But I also think someone who can see, um, I think the problem solving thing, the solution finding thing, um, is really key to being a great assistant. So someone who's not deterred by the word no, um, and someone who um, is willing to, like, and able to find other ways around and find other angles from which to approach things. Yeah. Um, and someone who can really do um, do the thinking work that makes it easier for the leader to make a decision. So every decision we make, there's a ton of thinking and research and, you know, well, what about this? And what about that? That goes into it. And oftentimes I don't think we're even aware of all that work happening in our brain. Um, 
but I think someone who can do the bulk of that for a leader, um, kind of present them with the information and it makes it, um, leaders can make so much more decisions and they can make them more quickly and more efficiently um, so that they can really spend the bulk of their time doing, um, ultimately doing the thing that God has called them to do um, that no one else can do. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm curious if you have like I, I'm. This is something that maybe you you've not thought about this way before, but I love like a good metaphor or an analogy. Do you have a a sense of like are you like the bones to the body, or are you like do you view yourself as like in the navigation seat beside the driver, telling them like helping them get them out? Like what would be like an analogy for how you view yourself in the team, or like in the structure? Yep, I think um, navigator is a really um, is a really good analogy. Um, you know, I used to say, you know, back when I had my business, I used to say like every superhero needs a sidekick, um, and we are yours. You know, so that person um, who is yeah navigating, figuring out the best route, presenting, you know, we could go this way or we could go that way, or you know, oh, I see this obstacle up ahead. Um, but who's, and who's also like cheering you on, like when you've been driving mm. 12 hours, yeah. going, um, like we're almost there. Um, no, you're not crazy for wanting to drive to the night and, you know, reach this destination. Um, so that championing part I think is also, um, really important. Yeah. We, um, in, in my church right now, we're in a series on spiritual gifts and, so this is new learning for me, the gift of administration, like this, the spiritually empowered part of it. The the translation yeah. can also be, instead of administrator, it can be helmsman, which is the person in the ship that steers the ship where it needs to go, but they're not the one who decided where it's going. Um, right. Like the captain of the ship yeah. says, okay, we're going to go from A to B, and the helmsman is the one who's going to figure out the details of navigating the ship based on where the captain yeah. intends to go. And and that's, yeah. I think, probably where uh, the administratively gifted person can get in trouble is when they try to be yeah. the captain, but they're the helmsman. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I think the best administrators ha- do not have a desire to be the captain. Like, genuinely um, do not have the desire. I remember a couple of years into my business, I remember someone asking me um, when I was going to have the courage to go after my own dream instead of huh. just helping other people with theirs. Um, and that really, like, it got to me. It bothered me. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about it and praying through it. And I finally came to the conclusion, like, you no, know, I was living my dream. And now it wasn't a dream I would say I could articulate when I started my business, but I, I truly love, um, being like the one behind the scenes, being the one helping to steer the ship, being the one navigating. Um, I genuinely do not have a desire to be the captain. Um, yeah. and, um, I think that too often people see administ- like administrative roles as a stepping stone to the top. Um, and I think that that's unfortunate. And I think that's probably how we get some ineffective administration. Um, I really think the, the most effective ones are just truly passionate about steering. And about yeah, navigating. being the second chair. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, sometimes though, from that administrator position, the hel- if it's the analogy of the navigator in the car or the helmsman on the ship or whatever it may be, um, there are yeah. times where you might see something that the leader doesn't see. Um, particularly, like, if you're like, you know what, like, this just isn't possible. Like, like somebody comes in yeah. with this great idea and dream, and, like, the administrator in the room's like, oh, my gosh, like, that's, yeah. do you know how much money that's going to be? Do you know how much time? Like, we have yeah. one day to pull this off. We can't get that, we <clears throat> can't get that thing from the printer in time. I don't know, whatever it is. Yeah. I'm thinking of yeah. these great, creative, innovative leaders that you've worked with for many, yeah. many years. Um, yeah. How do you, how do you, as a, how do you, how do you approach that conversation? Uh, yeah. 
what what's your advice for people who have to bring reality not you don't want to be the wet blanket but you got to bring reality to the right. room <laughs> yep absolutely that is a great question um so a few things i think um being a really effective administrator is a continual process of redefining what is not possible um and so i think it's constantly um checking yourself and making sure you're not just shutting something down because you haven't done it before or because mm -hmm. of a bad past experience with that thing. So um, I think it's a constant process of that, of going, you know, wait, could this be possible? Um, and the second thing is I remember, so when I was working at the church um, right out of college, I remember one day my pastor and one of our key volunteers, they walked into my office um, and my chair faced the door in my office. So they said, um, hey, we have an idea to run by you. And I'm working on my computer. And so I turned around and they, my pastor looked at me and said, now, before I tell you this idea, I need to say this. I do not need you to tell me why this won't work. I need huh. you to tell me how we can make it work. Um, and I did not necessarily like that statement at the time, <laughs> but in like, as I look back at my, as like my, my professional life, that was definitely a key learning moment that changed, um, that really changed how I think and how I communicate. So what I realized in that, in that conversation was, um, it, a lot of it comes down to how we communicate the obstacle, obstacles are how we communicate the hurdles. Um, because honestly, most things actually are possible with enough money or enough time or enough, you know, manpower. And so learning to say, Hey, we can, we actually, yeah, we can do that. Here are the implications of that decision. Right. So we right, can do that, right. but it's going to cost us this much or we you know, we actually, we would need to do it in three days, not three hours, or we can do it in three hours, but we, you know, we need 10 extra people to do it. So right. I think a lot of it is that it's learning to actually communicate solutions um, instead of problems um, and making your leader aware of the implications of a particular solution. Um, and then letting them decide, like recognizing ultimately it is their call because God has placed them as the leader. Um, and so you do your due diligence of, um, you know, the role that God has given you in saying, hey, here's what that's going to mean. Um, and then letting them make the call based on that. Yeah. Well, I love what you're saying in so many ways, but a lot of it is that I think sometimes a leader who has some big idea, vision, something they want to pull off for that Sunday at church or that next event or whatever they're launching yeah. or doing next, they don't understand the implications of it or how that affects the team. And so they've made, right. and so the team might get hurt, frustrated, annoyed, and certainly that can lead into some like toxic you know, talking behind the leader's back or whatever gross stuff that that can yeah. lead to. Maybe because the team hasn't, or, you know, the administrator or whoever that is, they need to communicate the implications properly. Okay, we can do right. that if, but here are the cons, or here's what we have to stop doing in order to make this other right. new thing, this new direction happen or or whatever. Yeah. Um, do you yeah. have um, some, some, I'm curious on like a really practical level, some ways that you communicate as a team. Uh, are there like some apps or some tools or some meetings you have regularly? How do you, how do you guys keep in good communication? Yeah. Um, Obviously, we do a lot of texting. Um, oh, you mean our, like text like on your phone I or like yes. WhatsApp or yes. iMessage or whatever? Yes, typically uh, <laughs> iMessage, yeah. um, a lot yeah. of that. Um, in, my, in our current context, um, like within our department, we do a weekly team meeting, um, which is part practical, but also part inspiration and just kind of keeping us all on the same page in terms of mission and vision and why we're um, you know, doing the spreadsheets and the endless emails and those sorts of things. Um, we also currently use a project management app called Teamwork, um, which oh, I okay. love. Um, there's so many incredible project management applications out there, um, some more robust than others. 
Um, but teamwork is one I love. Um, I used to really love Todoist. I used to Todoist a lot um, back in the day. Um, I think also if you're working with a team that is a bit more spread out um, or a bit larger, um, Slack, I think, is a really great tool um, for communication and those sorts of things. Um, email, I think we have to be careful with email for internal communication because I think we can get to drowning in it. And yeah. that's why, like, I think a project management software where you communicate um, from a task-oriented perspective and an action step-oriented perspective um, really helps everyone work more, like, efficiently and effectively so that um, you're not spending too much time on the little things. Yeah. And it, help, it gives you peace of mind that, you, um, that you're not forgetting things, um, which I think is really helpful from a, like, mental load perspective. Um, having things in a system where every month it's going to remind you to do an important task um, really gives you the mental bandwidth to um, focus on some bigger ideas or new projects and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's true that like there are so many ways we can communicate now that it can be overwhelming if you don't have like an agreed yeah. upon system. Like you're getting like, I don't know, Facebook message and WhatsApp and iMessage and, in, and suddenly people are messaging yeah. you on Instagram <laughs> and Slack and email and your third email yeah. address and, and, and it just can go crazy. And like, I don't, yes, how many, yes, how many absolutely. of us are saying, I mean, as a non-administrator myself, uh, <laughs> how many, I'm like, I know you emailed or messaged me somewhere about that. Where yeah. did you send that information to me? And so, yes. you know, the, the more kind of like common, consistent tool we can have a, a bunch of group, I'm sure that makes a big difference when your team is all over the yeah. place all the time. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And I also, I personally, like if someone sends me something, even in a text message, like especially on a weekend or at night that I know I need to handle the next morning, I will take 10 seconds and I will copy that text and I will paste it in an email to myself okay. because I know if it's in my inbox, I won't forget it. Um, you know, so like from my phone, that's the quickest action I can take. Um, so that seems like, yeah. it may seem like extra work to some people, but I do think it's, it's really helpful and helps me not forget things yeah. that come through random communication channels. Yeah. You know, just as sort of one of my last kind of big questions to you, I think in some ways you're answering it, but I want to ask more directly, do you yeah. view your work as ministry? Uh, and like, how, how is this ministry for you? Um, short answer, absolutely. Um, honestly, I think that as believers, no matter what work we're doing, we are doing ministry. We are ministering to people. Now, obviously, I think there's a difference between professionally working in ministry, that kind of being your career. Um, and obviously, that is very much, you know, work for a faith-based nonprofit. So definitely um, very much ministry. Um, but I definitely see it as, um, you know, you talked about the spiritual gifts earlier. Like, I really do believe that... Um, you know, administrators who are effective in um, faith-based organizations, whether that be a church, there is definitely a significant um, speech um, that has to be present um, in order for it to really work. Um, so, yes, definitely see it as ministry. Um, I definitely see it as um, soul and a conduit of what God is doing um, through a larger vision and through, you know, any particular leader's life. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, as you do your work and your life now mm -hmm. in California, far from yep. home and far from Nashville, you know, where mm -hmm. you built yeah. such meaningful relationships, like, what is God teaching you right now in your life? What are you learning? Yeah, I think one of the things um, that... I continue, he continues to remind me of, and I think that he teaches me new depths of in different seasons of my life is um, the truth that ultimately he's the one establishing things. Um, I love 
in First Corinthians, it talked about um, it's really not about the person who's watering or about the person who's God who makes everything grow. Um, and we just get to co-labor with him. Um, and I know for me, um, being someone who is very driven, who's very goal oriented, who likes to see things accomplished and finished and successful, um, it can be easy, but very dangerous to forget that ultimately the result, um, is not up to me. Like ultimately the result is in God's hands and he's the one, um, growing the work that we are sowing. Um, and I think that, um, in this season, he's reminding me of that, um, and kind of trying to instill that in my heart at a new level, which changes the ease. Um, I think the ease with which you work, um, obviously we have a lot on calendar is very full all the time. To do list is never ending. Um, but it's not, what's on the calendar or on the to-do list um, that makes or breaks my stress. It's kind of, it's where my heart is positioned um, in terms of the success of it all. Yeah. So if you were to, you know, the people listening who are feeling like they're in a similar kind of a role in maybe their organization, uh, but they might be feeling discouraged, maybe, maybe not treated. I don't know. Maybe they don't feel they're treated well, Mm -hmm. or maybe they feel like their work, they've been struggling to find the purpose and the meaning. Do you you have just like a word of encouragement for, for people in your kinds of work? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think I'd probably go back to, um, I'd probably go back to what I said. Um, and also that scripture reminds us that at the end of the day, we're working for God. We're not working for man. Um, and I think that especially anyone who's working, um, in a ministry, in a, you know, nonprofit, in a church that can be, that can easily get, we can forget, um, that yes, on, on earth, we are, you know, working for this person, but in the kingdom work that we're doing, um, ultimately we're working for God. Um, and so I think that's, I think that's an important and to just pray that God would move that in our heads, right. But that God would move that knowledge from our heads to our heart so that we can work from that perspective. Um, so that we don't, um, like, so we don't get bitter. So we don't get burned out in those sorts of things. Yeah. Awesome. Katie, thanks so much for your time today. Um, and I know for a lot of us yeah. now, we know one of the people, one of the key people behind a lot of the stuff we see Christine Kane doing. If she got, if she got somewhere on time for, uh, for speaking, maybe you were somehow <laughs> involved in that. <laughs> or things there we like go. That. But we just, yeah, it's great to get behind the scenes with you and into your mind and your heart about how administration and great, as you called it in your previous business, quote unquote, dirty work, how that can serve uh, creative leaders. And I just love seeing you do that so well. So thanks for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. It was fun to chat with you. Well, thanks so much, Katie, for your time today. It was just great to have that conversation and the work of leading administration and details in just a fast-paced setting with high-capacity leaders and an organization like Christine Kane's. It just makes impact all over the world, and the work of those kinds of people like Katie really, really matters alongside creative people. Next week, speaking of creatives, we have the creative mind of C.J. Cassiata, and he's going to be talking about his book called Get weird. It's all about how being weird actually makes the difference. And he's the creator of Ring Beller, which is video lessons that teach kids creativity and kindness in this incredibly creative and entertaining way. So you're going to want to come back next week for CJ. Thanks again to our sponsor, Wycliffe College. Remember, they're affordable, just about $602 Canadian if you're Canadian to go there to school at the University of Toronto. And it's flexible too, in class, online, full-time, part-time, whatever 
whatever works for you. If you're thinking about taking a course in theology or New Testament or church history or whatever that may be, I want you to consider Wycliffe College. Go to wycliffecollege.ca slash wordmadedigital and you can see an interview with me. You can check out some more details about what they have to offer and I'll see you back next week with CJ Cassiata. Thanks for listening to the Word Made Digital podcast with Joanna LaFleur. If you like this content, hit subscribe and share this episode with your friends. Head over to joannalafleur.com for more free tools, interviews, and media for creatives and communicators. We'd love to help you be the best you can be at communicating the best news in the world.